Good morning, everyone. It is great to be with you on this holiday weekend and also with all of you who are worshiping and joining us online from many different locations today. It is good to be with you. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but Dave Brown, who's our executive pastor, uh, who was just a service host, also was right back here playing the guitar in worship this morning. And do you want to preach as well today? Do you want to do everything? Um, I just want to make it known today that I play the guitar. (laughs) Been here on staff seven years. Never been invited to the worship team. Uh, Welcome to week 16 of our series on Romans. If you'll turn to Rome, I'm just kidding. You guys got to pay better attention. We concluded Romans last week, and today we are beginning a new series called A Firm Foundation. And in this series, we're focusing on our identity as a part of our denomination. And some of you are sitting here going, what? Uh, Regardless of how long you've been here, maybe you have not attended our Next Steps class, and you're thinking, what denomination are we a part of? That's why we're in this series, to really reinforce what we believe, what we stand on as a church, we are a part of the Evangelical Covenant Church, otherwise known as, and you'll hear it mentioned around here, the ECC, the Evangelical Covenant Church. A brief introduction. In the mid-1800s, people began to immigrate here to the United States from Sweden, seeking faith and church reform and they referred to themselves as mission friends. They focused less on doctrinal arguments and more on personal faith in Christ and studying God's Word together. They gathered in homes, and as they did, they read the Bible out loud together, they sang songs together, and they had fellowship around a meal. So the ECC was founded by some of these Swedish immigrants in 1885. And since 1885, we covenant with each other by cultivating communities of worship committed to prayer, preaching, and study of the Word, celebrating the sacraments, and building relationships across gender, ethnicity, age, culture, and socioeconomic status. We equip loving, giving, growing Christians to reach out with the good news of Jesus Christ, evangelizing the lost, ministering to those in need, and seeking justice for the oppressed. That's the ECC. Does it sound like something you're happy to be a part of today? That's the ECC. Does it sound like something you're glad to be a part of today? The covenant is loyally devoted to five specific ministry focuses, and they are start and strengthen churches, develop leaders, make and deepen disciples, love mercy, do justice, and serve globally. The affirmations that we hold dear to our heart as a denomination include the following. We affirm the centrality of the Word of God. We affirm the necessity of new birth. We affirm a commitment to the whole mission of the church. We affirm the church as a fellowship of believers. We affirm a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit, and we affirm the reality of freedom in Christ. These are the affirmations on which this church stands. This is the firm foundation of Redeemer Church as an ECC church, and these are the six affirmations that we're going to focus on in this series. I'm really excited about it. We have a few guest preachers coming to join us from our denominational headquarters in Chicago, and I just can't wait for you to meet them and hear from them. But these affirmations are the gravitational center of the covenant. One final thing worth mentioning because I uh, happen to find it really interesting. 
Um, we are a part of the Mid-South Conference, which includes covenant churches in Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, and New Mexico. So I want to show you a map of covenant churches in Oklahoma. You'll see a little bit of Texas right there. But th this is the covenant churches in Oklahoma. You can see us up there in the corner. And, and also there is another covenant church who we love very much, uh, who's located just down this street right here, and down that street, and down that street, and that street, and over here as well. It's called Life Church. It's a tiny little gathering of people. <laughs> Don't know if you've heard of the pastor. His name's Craig. Um, and we love Life Church. Life Church is a covenant sister church as well. Um, but you can see there are just not many covenant churches in our area. Now I want you to look at a map of the Great Lakes Conference in the covenant denomination. I mean, there are more covenant churches in some of these cities than we have in our entire state, or actually our entire conference. And so recently, I'm with a highly revered leader in our denomination, Dr. Jonathan Wilson. And I asked him the question, Dr. Wilson, why are covenant churches so present up north and not in the south? And I don't know why I was expecting some really profound spiritual answer. And he just looked back at me and said, Adam, our roots are in Swedish immigrants. They like to live where it's cold. <laughs> wow. Okay. Let's begin. And as we do, let me say up front that I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone with this sermon because I'm, I prefer to walk verse by verse in Scripture. That's who I am. So if this is your first time to Redeemer, I just want you to know we're a Bible-preaching church. If you need evidence of that, we just finished 15 weeks of Romans, which kicked our tails in a good way. Um, but today's a little bit different, and that's why I'm out of my comfort zone. Today I'm not preaching through the Bible, but I'm preaching about the Bible. I'm not preaching biblical text, but I'm preaching about the Bible as a whole, and today's focus as we kick off this series is we affirm the centrality of the Word of God. As a church, we affirm the centrality of the Word of God. On February 20th, 1885, our covenant ancestors had an organizational meeting, and by the way, <laughs> We have the minutes to that meeting if you're looking for a good read. Um, the following confession was recorded that day to serve as our guide for collective moral discernment and action. Here it is. We confess that the Holy Scriptures, the Old and New Testament, is the Word of God and the only perfect rule for faith doctrine, and conduct. We confess that the Holy Scriptures, the Old and New Testament, is the Word of God and the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct. So, let's highlight pieces of this confession. Number one, the Old Testament is the foundation of the New Testament. Yes, the arrival of Jesus Christ commences the New Covenant but that does not eliminate Genesis to Malachi. The Old Testament enlightens us to how vast our sin problem is and how much we need a Savior. I want you to think for a moment of the biblical narrative as a play. And so you come in for Act 4, which is Jesus, and then Act 5, which is the church, but Act 4 and Act 5 would make no sense without Act 1, creation, Act 2, the fall, and Act 3, the history of ancient Israel. So you see how these two testaments work together. You can't have one without the other. In fact, I have a commentary in my office, a gift of my beloved friend Patricia Lloyd, 
before she was promoted to heaven, and it tells all the ways that the New Testament uses the Old Testament or quotes the Old Testament. It's a teeny little 1,200-page book, so you can see how these are mutually dependent texts, and so as you read the New Testament in your quiet time and with your family, read the Old Testament as well. Number two, Scripture is the perfect foundation for our faith. To articulate and defend this, I'll defer to 17th century German theologian Philip Spainer, who said this, thought should be given to a more extensive use of the Word of God. We know that by nature we have no good in us. If there is to be any good in us, it must be brought about by God. To this end, the Word of God is the powerful means since faith must be awakened through the gospel. We covered that quite a bit in Romans. Therefore, the more at home the Word of God is among us, the more we shall bring about faith and its fruits. What Spainer is implying here is that Scripture is a witness to and also the vehicle of revelation, the revelation of God to mankind, to humanity. The life and the ministry and the death and the resurrection and also the explanation of salvation and how to attain it is all there on the pages of Scripture. So it's the perfect foundation for faith. Are you tracking with me? Hello. You with me? Come back to me if you're not. Number three, Scripture is the perfect foundation for doctrine. The ultimate authority and source for theology is not creed nor confession, but Scripture itself. I'm going to say that again. The ultimate authority and source for theology is neither creed nor confession, but Scripture itself. If you have a theological question, consult the Bible. Not this. No. No. Consult the Bible. You want some examples? Thank you. Hey, man. Dave, you should have preached today. It's a sleepy crowd. Is the world a creation or an accident? Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Um, is there a God or are we alone? Now they're talking back to me and I can't finish my sentence. <laughs> is there a God or are we all alone? Read the Bible. Does God care about me? Read the Bible. These are real questions that people have all the time. How do I come to know God? Read the Bible. Why am I here? Why is sin so destructive and harmful? What is the purpose of my suffering? Do I have hope? What happens after I die? Read the Bible. Read the Bible. This is where you find these answers. Do you get the point here? As this scripture being the only foundation for doctrine, for theology. Read the Bible. I read this quote this week. I'm so sorry for all of those who do not read their Bible every day. I wonder why they deprive themselves of the strength and the pleasure found in those pages. We cannot afford to keep our Bibles shut. By the way, if you want to be a part of Redeemer, it doesn't matter how much Bible you know. You don't have to know a certain amount of Bible to belong here. You belong here, and then we're going to get to know the Bible together. Is that okay? All right. Number four. Number three 
was read the Bible. Okay, number four. Scripture is the perfect foundation for conduct. The pages of the Bible are full of principles and precepts and commands and warnings and guidelines that tell us how to live, all of which steer our lives toward that which is God-honoring and also good for our neighbor. Scripture was given to reveal, there's revelation, to reveal God's way of salvation. Yes, but additionally, Scripture trains us into righteous living. It tells us how to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord and fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, Colossians 1.10. Okay, faith, right? Doctrine. Ooh, now we get into conduct. How many of you would admit with me that we have faith and we have conduct, or excuse me, doctrine? We have our beliefs, we have our theology in place. How many of you would agree with me that we often struggle? when it comes to our behavior. How many would agree with me that we often struggle when it comes to our behavior? In fact, I saw an e-card this week that summarizes this quite well. Check this out. Oh, honey, you must have been confused. You're supposed to live out Bible verses, not just get them tattooed and hope that does the trick. And here's another one. I'm so glad you told me what a good Christian you are. Judging by your actions, I never would have known. My kids would say this, ooh, what a burn. What a burn. Okay, one more. Last one, I promise. Oh, you go to church and act like the perfect Christian on Sundays, but then you talk about people and create drama, judge others, lie, and act fake? Seems legit. How's everybody doing right now? I notice this is a little hard to laugh at. Because at some point, all of us wrestle with taking our faith and embracing our doctrine, but then living it out. All of us, one common denominator is that we have days where we can talk the talk, but struggle to walk that walk. You do know it's okay to laugh in church, right? It's okay to have a little bit of fun in church and make fun of ourselves. These e-cards are funny, but sadly can often be true. We find all we need to know about living a Christ-like lifestyle in the pages of Scripture, but we have to put it into practice. See, the Bible is a document that shapes not only our identity, but also the way in which we live. And that is completely counter-cultural. So if you never feel like your lifestyle, your choices, the way you spend your time, the places you go, and the way that you spend your money, if you never feel like those are, are in friction with culture, As your brother in Christ, read the Bible. Just a warning today, if we are not shaped by the Word, we are shaped by the world. If we are not shaped by the Word, we are shaped by the world. In all three of these, faith, doctrine, and conduct, hopefully you also notice these words, perfect foundation, perfect foundation. Scripture is a complete document to awaken faith, form theology, and guide behavior. Scripture is a complete document to awaken our faith, form our theology, and guide our behavior, meaning faith.
Faith is not awakened by mysticism, by philosophy, by superstition, palm reading, fortune telling, etc. Theology is not to be formed by false gospels, imagination, secularization, or even our personal preferences. Meaning conduct is not to be shaped by culture or competition or greed or ego. So, if Scripture is inspired by God, and we believe it is, then it is completely complete. I want you to think about that for a moment. Scripture inspired by God is completely complete. We do not add to Scripture. We do not subtract from Scripture. We do not sprinkle our own preferences on top of Scripture. We embrace it as it is, We revere it and we protect it. We preserve it no matter the cost. How serious is our treatment of Scripture? Listen to what professor of theology Donald Frisk says. If we are to be trustworthy, we dare not tame the message, tone it down, or domesticate it. We dare not accommodate it to the spirit of the age or make it acceptable by blunting its cutting edge. Whenever we are lured into proclaiming a comfortable and thereby innocuous gospel, our sin is visited on the generations to come. This is how important our treatment of Scripture really is. I mentioned earlier that today is a unique sermon, for me at least, because I didn't walk you through Scripture, but just talked about Scripture. Um, So to close, I have saved the best for last. I'm going to read about the Bible from the Bible. Can I read about the Bible from the Bible today? And as I do, allow these truths, these sacred words, to minister to your heart today. These are God's words. These are God's words. So as you listen, let these words draw you in to fellowship with the Holy Spirit today. Feel free to close your eyes, hold out your hands. I tell people all the time, if I'm reading God's word to you, I'm reading the best gift I could ever give you. So what do you do when you receive a gift? I hold out my hands. But posture your heart, posture your mind, Posture your spirit in a way to hear about the Bible from the Bible. Here is the sermon today. All Scripture is breathed out by God. 2 Timothy 3.16 Through endurance and through the encouragement of Scripture, we have hope. Romans 15, 4. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Matthew 24, 35. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, 105. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. Joshua 1, 8. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews 4, 12. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The precepts of the Lord are right. The commandment of the Lord is pure. The rules of the Lord are true. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. 
sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. In keeping them, there is great reward. Psalm 19, 7 through 11. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 4. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Isaiah 40, 8. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have the privilege of taking communion together this morning, and before we do, would you join me in this prayer of confession that will be on the screens. Let's pray this out loud together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. I invite our communion stewards to come forward and prepare. As they do, hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So church, come to this table today, not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify, not that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on the grace of God, but because in your frailty and sin, you stand in constant need of God's mercy and help. As you are ready, eat and drink today in remembrance of Christ, and may this sacred moment be food for your spiritual journey. We'll begin with the rows in the front. There are gluten-free elements available in every tray, and also kneeling rails down front if that interests you today. Let's worship through communion.